Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Good to see everybody here. Hallelujah. Oh, we're going to have a good time tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, would you stand up with me one more time? Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Shobra manashte didibi kele, o probon gurishta landa ba, nam brui vidishto rodokora namaste, brui vidi no rakasti joto promonosta, brui e jonda kaya namakia, sahalanguri dishtele da damori, siti vanguri tashte nemekia, bram banosta brui banasti boroki nastro irlan yambange. Sopra boriti shanda ma erna, nahungu di kandushti, vrandai e namandu kurditishta, lambru boringanasti, vuru kushtala anamaya, hale, kurditish, tenenemia, <laughs> sopra boshtinikia, brandine mondi goreta, sibro mongido dishtordaba, brandime stebo koda. Oh, Father, we purpose together tonight to be one in the Spirit. Hallelujah. And so we choose now to put aside things of the day, things of just moments ago, things, Father, of this world. And in our time together tonight, Father, we choose to step into the Spirit realm now in the name of Jesus and to think and to have the mind of Christ together. Father, we agree together for your word to come forth and your will to be done in the name of Jesus. Father, we even acknowledge the angels, Father. We thank you that tonight the message of the Lord will be implanted into our souls. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord will come and enlighten our spirits in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that the word of the Lord will even bring healing to our physical bodies even as we sit here tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, he's still doing great and mighty things. <laughs> Woo! Sabran banando bandoritashte bekando proba. Ha So we choose as an act of our will to fellowship together as spirit beings created in the image and destined to be conformed. Hallelujah. Into his likeness. And we give you all praise and all glory, Father, in the name of Jesus. And if you can agree with that, say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start there. And uh, we've got a little bit of a ways to go, but I believe we can get there. Hallelujah. We're going somewhere tonight, and we've got to get there. Hallelujah. And I believe we will. Uh, while you're turning uh, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, um, I brought with me some messages that, that I've done. I've been kind of producing them in this fashion here. And uh, they're out there. But I forgot my little thing, so I guess they're free. Uh, so if you want one, just grab one because I don't have any way of selling them. So <laughs> hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But I'm going to give these three away now. This one... This one, um, this one's good. This is called Vision, the Strategic Advantage. Now, listen, he had, there's blood over this. There's a covenant concerning this. He said that he would give us his spirit, and he would lead us in, into all truth. And the Amplified Bible says that he would reveal the future to us. The Bible says in Isaiah that only God knows the future. I hope you believe that because uh, he's the only one that can disclose, reveal, or highlight to you what is ahead for you, and there's a covenant of blood that seals that, and it gives you the strategic advantage. Hallelujah. So that's vision. Does anybody need some vision? You'd like to be encouraged in your vision, okay? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is a, a, a message I've done a, a couple times. This one's called Giants Are Bread for Us. Hallelujah. And in this season, if you're looking a little malnourished spiritually, it's, it's because you haven't gone after the giants in your life. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah, there you go, brother. Hallelujah. And then this one here, this is called guard your heart. The Bible says above all things. 
above all things, guard your heart. Hallelujah. Anybody uh, in recent times had any heart attacks? I'm, I, I'm, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about the enemy coming after your heart. Hallelujah, brother. There you go. Amen. And then there's some other titles out there. I just uh, avail yourself to them. If you don't have any money, then they're free. Hallelujah. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. And um, look at verse 1. We'll, we'll, we'll start here. It says, I, therefore, the, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, some people, uh, certain translations use the word vocation, not bad, but I don't think it's the highest revelation here. I think if you look at Ephesians as a whole, you'll see a mystery that was hidden from the beginning, but Paul was graced, and now you and I are, hallelujah, to be carriers of this. But he was revealing something about this new creation in Christ Jesus. So he's actually writing here saying what your ultimate calling is and your ultimate calling or your ministry is a heavenly calling, a heavenly ministry. We're seated with him where? At the right hand of the Father. Our ultimate uh, work or ministry is to operate from that seat right there in the heavenlies. Hallelujah. So I wanted to read that as a, a little bit of a segue. The, the title tonight, if, if you're taking notes, is Concentrated and Consecrated Effort. Concentrated and Consecrated Effort, subtitle, Glorious Demonstrations. We're to consecrate ourselves and consecrate and concentrate, say, say those words five times fast. We are to consecrate ourselves to our heavenly operation, and we're to concentrate on glorious demonstrations. Hallelujah. You ready to get into this tonight? Praise the Lord. All right, look at the Ephesians 4, verse 3. I think they're going to put it up on the screen in the New Living Translation. And it says this, make every effort. Let's say that together. Make every effort. Remember, he's calling us to a concentrated consecration concerning spiritual things or glorious demonstrations. So he says, make every effort to keep yourself. Let's see, they'll get that back, back on the screen. Ephesians 4, 3 in the New Living. It says it different in different translations. I like the way the NLT says it. Where's it at? There it is. That's the New King James. All right, it's close. Here's what the New Living says. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, in the Spirit, in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Make every effort. Let's all say that. Make every effort. Now, listen, this is kind of a little bit of, of, of a play on words. And, um, but, but one morning I woke up, and this, the Lord, I, I mean, it was just like, you know, it, He was emphasizing this strongly. And he kind of made a little bit of a play on words. If you go on, you read, read the rest of, of that verse. It kind of alludes to keeping yourself united in the bond of peace with other people. But contextually, he's also talking about your heavenly calling, your heavenly vocation, your heavenly outworking. And he's stressing here, stay united with the Spirit. Stay united with the Spirit. Make effort to stay connected with the Spirit. Listen, something is happening to the body of Christ. We're changing, folks. The Bible says that, that what? We go from what? Faith to faith. Come on. Glory to glory. Another verse says grace upon grace. Yet another verse in Psalms says we go from what? Strength to strength. Hallelujah. I see it as a progression of sorts. Hallelujah. Rev revelation is increasing and abounding. So are you and me. So something is happening. We're changing. We're coming into a greater 
glory. We're developing into a tangible reality of our inheritance as spiritual people. We're becoming, if you're taking notes, I love this word. It's an old word. Hardly anybody uses it. First time I heard it was this prophecy uh, by this lady named Clara Grace, 1967. She said that we were becoming amalgamate, amalgamate. You probably were like, what is that? Let me give you the definition, A-M-A-L-G-A-M-A-T-E, amalgamate. And it means this. It means to merge, to join. It means uniting, fusing, melding, consolidating, combining, blending. We are becoming amalgamate with our future. Our future is calling to us now more than it ever has. The Spirit and the bride say what? Come, hallelujah. We're, we're, we're closer now, hallelujah, than we've ever been. <laughs> oh, I love saying that because it's kind of funny, but we are right there. We're, we're at the very end of the age. There's a great transition taking place. You know, in that passage, uh, Revelation, where he said, come up here. It's like I, I'm, I'm hearing that stronger and louder than I've ever heard it before. Up, yes, as in positionally, yes, above. We would get that. Heaven, heaven is calling, right? But more specifically, in a, uh, it means come up here, come up into this place of domination, Come up into this dimensionally, it's a greater position, a greater demonstration. It's a higher, it's an overarching, it is a uh, dimensionally greater operation of authority and power. We're being called up in, into that place. Let me say it like this because so many of us are there uh, positionally because of the Scriptures, but operationally we quite haven't obtained yet. We're growing in that understanding. We're becoming more, let's see, how do I say it? We're becoming more comfortable in operating from that place. Hallelujah. The place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Yes, heaven. But there is a place in him in which we live and move and have our being. Now, at the beginning of the year, uh, it was the 1st of January, and the Lord gave me a prophetic word, and I want to share that with you here. And this is what the Lord said. He said, tell the people to make every effort to fellowship together in, stay united with, and keep focused on the mandate of becoming a glorious people with a glorious demonstration a spiritual people with a spiritual demonstration. The Lord went on to say, many congregations are unwilling to cooperate with me to move into deeper things. Some would say, that's not me, though. No, I don't believe it is. You know, even the household of faith, you know, I, I don't mean to pick on, we, I don't judge anybody, I judge myself, but even in the household of faith, it seems like some have just come into the foyer but they haven't moved on into the rest of the house to enjoy the rooms, to see what all the house has to offer. They have become entertained in the foyer area. Now, write this down. Let me give you a definition here for the word entertainment. Entertainment. It's, it's a compound word, enter and then tain. Tain is a Latin word, and it means held up. It means held up. It means to be trapped or contained in the entry. Enter, entry, tained, Latin word, to be held up. To be held up in the entry. Now listen, if the Lord's calling us to greater consecration and greater concentration, we need to consider what is fighting or militating against that concentration. Entertainment fights against your concentration because it fills your imagination with things. The imagination, you can write this down. This isn't my message, but I'll give you this for free. Imagination, your imagination, your sanctified imagination is the gateway to the spiritual realm. 
entertainment fights for that space. And if you fill up what is to be sanctified for the Lord, you set your mind on things above. To be carnally minded is to be at enmity with what? The Spirit. That's Romans 7 and several other passages. So he said, I want you to concentrate. I want you to consecrate because I want you to become a glorious people with glorious demonstrations, a spiritual people with spiritual demonstrations. But if you get held up in the entry or the 101 or the um, elementary principles, you won't go on and experience the rest of the house that's being built up. You realize there's three major metaphors uh, the building, the body, and the bride. And he has blueprints for all of these things. He's both, he's the Rosh Pana, he's the cornerstone and the capstone. He's been building this thing up. But so many of us haven't gone past the foyer. We've hung our jackets up and haven't gone anywhere. We've taken our hats off but haven't walked into the rest of the home. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, hey, he's talking to you. You need to pay attention. Ha, hallelujah. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Is, is this okay? All right, because if it's not, I better stop now. I, 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 I don't have anything else. <laughs> this is it. This is it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, Father. Listen, it was from this house that the Lord said that he's bringing us into the end mysteries to release glory. Isn't that right? Remember, several years ago, was it uh, 2019, September, both Sister Billy, Dr. Larry, uh, even um, Lynn, Lynn Mink, didn't they have a prophetic word? Lord's calling us in, in to glory. What's he doing? Well, he's, he's building upon his word to us. He's drawing us into a place of glory, an operation of glory. We are becoming glorious. That's the plan. That's the trajectory. Hallelujah. And we're getting on board with that. We are concentrating on it. We are consecrating ourselves to it. Listen, there is no other plan than the revealed word of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but this is where we're going. Hallelujah. This is it. Oh, we're coming into great demonstrations of glory. So we're becoming amalgamates. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. So entertained, to be trapped or held up or contained, to be detained. Contained, detained, held up in the entry. The house that Jesus is and has been faithful over is coming to completion. And the totality or the synergy of the structure is being made available to us in its fullness. It's time for us to explore the totality of the house. Remember, he said, in my Father's house. There are many different translations say different things. I'm going to use this word just for our sake tonight. In my Father's house, there are many places. There are uh, diversities of operations. There are things that you and I have yet to experience, but they've been in reserve. What are Bible mysteries? Bible mysteries are hidden things, but they're not hidden from you. They're hidden for you until the time that they come to revelation. You and I are coming into Kairos moment, Moed opportunities, things that have been in reserve until the body could come. Remember, uh, they were asking Jesus several things. He says, hey, look, you, you can't bear it now. But listen, guess where you and I are, are at? We're at the time where we can bear it now. This is this is what I've been. Uh, this is what I've been hearing. That we've come into a inheritance season. We've come into a double portion. The son's portion of inheritance is the double portion. And uh, we've come into a season where a maturity to where God is now disclosing to us. Remember, He said, "I'm going to give you keys." Now, listen. I understand keys represent authority, and in context, He said, "With these keys, you will be able to bind and loose." I, I understand that. Here's what I believe the Holy Spirit added to it. He said, keys are the knowledge of how things work in the Spirit. 
Who's he giving these, these keys to? You don't give keys to infants. He's been waiting and anticipating. He's been building and working. We've been coming into a full stature. I believe heaven has been anticipating, hallelujah, this time where he could begin to disclose how things work in the Spirit. Why is there understanding and revelation knowledge concerning things we didn't have 50 years ago? You, un you understand that in Jesus' day, that the laws that govern flight were in operation, yet nobody were f was flying in planes. Why? Because there was a time appointed for the revealing of how things work in the Spirit. There's nothing new under the sun. Only now the sun and the light off of the sun has now given illumination to things that have been obscured by or the attempt of the power of darkness to hide things in plain sight. The path of the righteous, can you finish it, gets what? Brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. Listen, so in the progression here of spiritual development, we're coming into the understanding and the knowledge of things that before we weren't able to bear, but now we are. Does that excite anybody? I mean, hallelujah. Woo! Yeah! These are amazing days. Jesus went on to say, now I, di I didn't hear this audibly, but just an impression in, in, in my spirit. I just wrote down what I heard the Lord say. He said, tell them, that would be you, that their development and my expectation is not what the mind alone, he's talking about the soulless realm, not what the mind alone can contain or comprehend. He said, tell them. I do not intend for them to chronicle by the hearing of the natural ear another person's experiences. Tell them hope and expectation will no longer be deferred. He said this, faith without works is dead. And your faith, this is the word of the Lord, and your faith is going to be fully alive in these moments right now. The Lord said, I will be with you as you begin to go and do. I am going to show you great and mighty things. Did you understand what he was saying? A lot of us, we've just written down these amazing stories by other folk. But he said, you were never destined to just chronicle someone else's experiences. As amazing and fascinating those guys' stories are, he said, I want you. I want you. He said, I want you. He said, I want you. I don't want your faith to be dormant anymore. I want you to have a work. Oh, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. All right, uh, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah 5, 21. Jeremiah 5, 21. Hallelujah. He has done great things, and so will I. He has done great things, and so, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not a singer, so I was trying to figure out how to make that work, but hallelujah, so will I, so will we, so will you, hallelujah. This is our time, hallelujah, he created us for this. To bring us into glory. We, we, we're we're, we're going to be a demonstration of glory. All right, look at this, Jeremiah 5, 21. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Classic. He says, hear now this, O foolish people. Foolishness is not having mental capacity for. 
foolishness isn't necessarily, uh, you know, saying like this person is just um, ridiculous or obnoxious. It, it, it can include that in other areas, but the basic generic meaning of foolish is not having the mind for a thing. All right, so he said, now hear this, O foolish people, without understanding or heart, notice this, who have eyes yet see not, who have ears, of course he's referring to natural, they have natural eyes, but they don't see nothing. They have natural ears, but they're not hearing anything. This is what he's saying here. So he's saying that there is an understanding that isn't obtained by natural eyes and ears. Let me read it one more time. He said, hear, hear, hear now this, you, you foolish ones. He said, you have eyes, and you think you see, but you're blind. You have ears, and you think you're keen of hearing, but you're really deaf. What's, what's he telling them? There is an understanding that is not obtained through natural eyesight and natural hearing. Many people, again, like these foolish ones, they're deceived. They see, they think they see, but they're blind. They think they're here, but they're deaf. And in our new covenant reality, it would be foolish to not have understanding of how things work in the Spirit when it is being given to us to know these things. Remember, the Lord said, make every effort to fellowship together in, stay united with, keep focused on the mandate of becoming a glorious people with a glorious demonstration, a spiritual people with a spiritual demonstration. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 real, real quick. 1 Corinthians 3. Oh, we're going somewhere. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, that's 2 Corinthians. Let me go to 1 Corinthians. Here we go. He said, I, brethren, could not speak to you as what? Spiritual people. But as to carnal, as to babies in Christ or infants in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive, and even now you're still not able. For you are still carnal. Do we have first, uh, verse 3 in the Passion Translation? If they don't have it on the screen, I'll read it to you. Listen to what verse 3 in the Passion says. It says, For you are living your lives dominated by the mind set on the things of the flesh. So he came to these people, and listen, this was their day of visitation. You understand this, right? Paul was sent to them, hallelujah, to begin to disclose to them mysteries, things that even the angels are inquiring about. And here he comes to them expecting them to be in a spiritual condition uh, and capable of receiving spiritual understanding and information and revelation. Well, when he gets there, he, he finds out. He said, man, are y'all not acting like, uh, uh, one translation says, are you not acting like mere men? And he, he tells them what their problem is. He said, you have your mind has been dominated by things of the flesh, a.k.a. natural realm. And because your mind has been dominated by natural things, I'm not able to communicate to you as a spiritual person. He goes on to say, ask yourselves, is there jealousy among you? Do you compare yourself with others? Now, this is the short list. This is not an exhaustive list here. This, he's just giving them the, the, the top three or four. He says, do you not quarrel like children and end up taking sides? If so, this proves you are living your lives centered on yourselves, dominated by a mind set on the flesh or the natural realm. And he finishes, off, uh, finishes it, it off in the Passion. And behaving like what? Unbelievers. Now, I reference this passage a lot in a lot of my messages because it's very clear, it's very concise, and it points to the fact that we can miss our moment of being brought up and into new spiritual things. If, someone say if, 
if we are more concerned about the natural, fleshy things, activities, etc., and if we are more self-focused and self-centered, we won't even have the ears to hear or the eyes to see what God is wanting to demonstrate right in front of us. That's not us. We will not miss our moments of spiritual understanding and awakening. Go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Oh, hallelujah. Acts 9, let's look at verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He asked letters from him to the synagogues so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground, and he ver- uh, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Verse 7, And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Verse 8, then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Verse 9, he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, this story... You know the story, it's Paul, but prior to him becoming Paul, he was Saul. And in this story right here, prior to this experience, he was a foolish, blind man. Now, I say foolish because foolish is not having the mental capacities for something. He was a foolish, blind man until, in a split second, Jesus gives him understanding. And in a moment, this man went from being blind to having eyes that see. Now, the interesting thing that I find so fascinating in this passage is that even though the eyes of his understanding were opened, God caused his natural eyes to be blinded for three days. I think God wanted to drive the point home in this situation. If you're taking notes, write write this down. Here's the point God was trying to make, not only with Paul, but to you and I tonight. Here it is. Our reliance on our natural sight is keeping us blinded to another dimension. Our reliance. Now listen, he was foolish. He could see with his natural eyes. He could hear with them flappers on the side of his head, but he was foolish. He had no capacity for spiritual understanding. So God said, hey, I'm going to help you, brother. I'm, I'm going to do something. It's going to be obvious. I'm going to blind your natural eyes to prove my point to you, Paul. That what you really need to be looking at What you really need to see, what you really need to hear is into another dimension. Hallelujah, somebody. Um, What is the power of darkness? I alluded to it, or I think I even said it. The power of darkness. I had looked that up. Remember, it says we have been delivered, transferred, conveyed away and out from what? The kingdom of darkness and out from under the what? The power of darkness. That phrase, power of darkness, is used in several, several places. And I was asking the Lord one time, what is the power of darkness? What is the power of darkness? Well, here's a functioning definition. It is the attempted ability to hide a thing in plain sight. Listen. You can be, there, there are people in this room that may not see the same things I see. 
what is that working against you? Darkness is a spiritual strategy. Darkness isn't just the reality of no natural light when they turn off the electricity. That's a derivative. Darkness is a spiritual condition. Darkness is a force. The power of darkness is the enemy's attempted ability to utilize that force to hide something from your knowledge in plain sight. Now, the interesting thing about the power of darkness is it cannot move the object. It can only obscure its position to you. Remember in Proverbs, he says that, Proverbs chapter 4, there's people that are stumbling around in the dark, tripping on stuff, and they don't know what they're tripping on. What is that? The power of darkness in someone's life. I mean, you're, 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 you're sitting there going, it's right there, bro. That's the answer. That's the person. That's the thing. That's, that's what you should do. And they're going, what? I, I, I just don't see, I don't see it. Someone has revelation. Someone has understanding, and they're, they're trying to help you be like, I just don't see it. I just don't I, I don't, I don't get it. Why? That's darkness working against you. Now, the power of darkness, the Bible says that he's the God of this what? World, 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 age, time, natural, natural. Think natural. He's the God of the natural. Natural, natural, think mortal. It's a spiritual condition. Natural is a spiritual reality. It's a fallen, it's a derivative, it's a low. He's the God of what? Natural, because he's been bound to that realm. And when Adam fell, he entered into the what? The natural And he's the he's the uh, he's the um, he's the ruler of darkness. So if he's the god of the natural, then we get this understanding that the natural realm is easily manipulated. The natural realm is easily manipulated because the natural is subservient to the greater reality, that's the spiritual realm, but because darkness is the God of this age, it's easily manipulated. Darkness is the strategy that manipulates this realm. Again, darkness can't move that speaker, but it can hide it from me. Your promotion is right here. Your promotion is right there. Your spouse is right here. The this is right there. I'm tearing up y'all's stuff. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, let me use the mic stand. That's a better, a lot cheaper if I break it. Um, darkness. Darkness. This is why vision is the strategic advantage. Most people don't see the mic stand. The entrance of his word giveth I see the mic stand now. Light overcomes the dark. Listen, I don't see the mic stand because we turn the light switch on. I see the mic stand because his word gave me revelation knowledge. Um, you know, it, like take the natural. There is no off switch. There's no dark switch. Darkness is the what? The absence of light. Now, because of spiritual law, it's not that uh, God doesn't want to come in and flip on the light in people's lives. Spiritual law puts it within you. You have to call upon the name of the Lord. But you understand that if we were to turn the lights out in this room, it's because we turn off revelation there's no vacuums. What fills the space? Darkness. So if you have an understanding issue, what do you have? You have a word issue. If you don't know what you're supposed to do, what do you have? Well, you need a mystery revealed. He knows exactly where every mic stand that's been predestined in your life is. Hallelujah, somebody. So the natural realm or being 
dominated by the flesh. That's the part of you that's only known. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, if the natural realm is easily manipulated, this is why Proverbs says, lean not on your own what? Understanding one translation says what? In sight. It says don't lean on your own what? Insight. What is insight? It's the, it's the data accumulated through your natural senses. Your mind processes it and kicks back an action or a response. But if the natural realm is easily manipulated, you don't want to trust in or lean on what the natural part of you feeds back off of the natural realm. He says, but lean on and trust in what? The Lord or his word. He said, put it in where? Your eyes, your ears, put it in front of you. Meditate on it. Chew it. Taste it. Drink it. Eat it. He said, eat my flesh. Why? Because it's light in a dark world. Look at this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. No natural eye has seen, nor natural ear has heard, nor has entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for him who loved him. Go down to verse 14. But the what man? The natural man. The flesh-dominated man. Listen, when you were born again, your spirit was born again. The Bible says that your soul is saved by the implanting of the word. You know what the Bible says about the flesh or the natural part of you or your tent? Remember, we are coating here. We're ta uh, ta tabernacling. That, that, that's a tough word. Tabnacling. We're tabnacling, okay? Um, this is a tent. This body is subjected in hope but into a spiritual condition called what? Mortality. Until we what? Put off this body and take on what? A body likened unto his. Now listen, that hasn't happened yet. At that point, you will have a body that doesn't fight against you. Remember, remember what Galatians says? Flip over there real, real quick. Hold your place in 1 Corinthians because we're coming right back. Is this okay? How are we doing on time? Uh, Galatians 5, verse 16, I say then walk in the Spirit. Now, I, I'm, you know, I am a novice, but I'm going to suggest something to you. Uh, that it says uh, walk in the Spirit, capital S. I'm going to say that's a lowercase s. And he says walk in the Spirit or according to your spirit. Now, listen, we're talking about born again, folk. If you're born again, your spirit is one with him. Okay, we're not talking about an unregenerate or an unrighteous spirit. We're talking about a spirit that's been born again. It's a new creation that never even existed before. It's pure, righteous, holy unto him. You're one with him. He's dwelling in your spirit. You're seated in him. He's in you and you're in him. That part of you, the spirit part of you, is clean. He says, don't, don't walk or walk according to the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the what? The lusts of the flesh. Now, here's what the Bible says about your body. Discipline it through hardship, put it under, crucify it daily. Why? Because that's the part of you that has no mind for spiritual things. Listen, he says, for the flesh lusts against your spirit, and your spirit lusts or militates against your flesh. What's he talking about? My born-again spirit, I'm in this body trapped in mortality, meaning it only knows natural reality. All of its natural senses can only pick up natural things. It doesn't understand spiritual senses or spiritual reality. Therefore, when I inquire of my flesh, should I give $20 in the offering? Your flesh will never agree with you. Well, what do you think, body? What do you think about that? Should we uh, stay up and fast and pray? No, I don't think that's a good idea. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man, the natural man does not what? Receive the things of the Spirit. Why? For they are what? Meaning, in your naturalness, in the body part of you, there is no faculties that have the perceptive ability to know there is a spiritual realm. 
you say, body, in the name of Jesus, be healed. It's his arm in so much pain. I just want to die. And you say, it's okay. By his stripes, he healed us. And your body goes, what? And so the soul part of you becomes a derivative of either a spirit-dominated reality or a flesh-dominated one. Now, if you're a spirit-dominated one, you will put under, come on, you will say, you know what, just suck it up and tough it out, buddy, because in the name of Jesus, it's going to manifest. Hallelujah. But listen. But if I keep giving ear to you, come on, if I keep making it easier on you, come on, if I allow you to live for a day, you're going to dominate me. And then I won't experience spiritual realities because guess what? I can't if I'm dominated by the natural. Oh, hallelujah. Go to Romans. Let's stop at um, let's stop at Romans eight, verse five. For those who live according to the flesh, set their what minds or imagination. Remember, the soulish realm. Your mind. Uh, let me say it like this. Ro- Romans ten says, "With what do we believe? With the heart we believe." You don't believe with with the mind. The mind was designed to agree with something. It's either going to agree with the natural flesh part of you or it's going to agree with the spirit. Those who set their mind on the things of the flesh, who become dominated, their imaginations become dominated, their minds, their thoughts become dominated with the reality of the natural insight, the incoming data based on the flesh, is what? Well, let's just read that. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, again, that I'm not going to argue this, but it's a lowercase s, I think. Those who live according to the Spirit, the unction of your spirit. The Spirit of man is the what? The lamp of the Lord. When he speaks to you, he doesn't speak to your body, he speaks to your spirit. And your whole inner man will go... <laughs> Your spirit becomes illuminated, and then what does your spirit do? It'll light up on your mind. This is why I always put my hand here. It just helps me to focus. Where's your spirit? Is it in your stomach? No, it's in your innermost being. King James says it's in your bowels, meaning it's just the deepest part of you. And so when God illuminates my spirit, my spirit illuminates my mind so that my mind can give action to my body so that I can obey. He doesn't speak to my elbow. God's God's calling. (laughs) What are you saying, Lord? <laughs> Verse 6, to be what? Carnally, carne, meat, meat-minded, flesh-minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Why? Because the what? Is what? What do you think, body? What do you think, bank account? Should we give $20? <laughs> what do you think? Should we fast and pray? I'm thinking we should do a 10-day fast, body. What do you think about that? It, it has no response because it, because it has no faculty for receptivity of spiritual things. What part of you does? Your spirit. So again, we're saying that the nat- I, s- I said all that to say this. The natural realm is easily manipulated. You smell a thing. You hear a thing. You read a, you read a thing. Somebody punched you. And all of a sudden, you define everything by a natural impulse. But you don't realize that that natural was influenced by an unseen realm. And if you make your decision based on just the natural response to spiritual influence, giving no consideration for the influence behind the natural, you too will be manipulated. Lean not on your own incoming data received by your five natural senses. It's hot, it's cold, oh, that 
that hurt my emotions. Oh, that sounded weird. I'm offended. Oh, they're, they don't like me. This, that. They're mad. They're angry. This and that. Oh, the tree fell. And the money in the bank account. No food. None of my job. He fired me. And What do you say? Be steadfast. Immovable. What? In the faith. And what? That which he has given me by way of the new spirit, my perceptive ability to know what's going on behind the scenes, the strategic advantage. Hallelujah. All right, I got a little bit more here. All right, look at this, or just write this down. Isaiah 5.21, woe to those. Isaiah 5.21, woe to those who are wise in or based upon their own eyes, natural, and prudent in or based upon their own sight or hearing. You can be wise as a, re- as a result of your own eyes. But understand that natural-based insight and understanding is 2D. Someone say 2D. And it's mostly the accumulation and organization of sense-based input. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, the guy or the girl that knows a lot about birds. This bird is red. That bird is blue. The red bird eats this kind of bug this time of year, at this time of day, on this side of the world. Wow. You have a lot of information that has been organized and memorized. 2D. Wow. You ever heard of George Washington Carver? There's a book that you need to read. It's an easy read. It's called The Man Who Talks With Flowers. The Man Who Talks With Flowers. And it's a first-person interview and a kind of a story uh, about George Washington Carver. And he said this, that he never took any textbooks into his lab except for the Bible. And what he would do is he would take his Bible into his lab. Now, this is a guy that came up with like 300 uses of, of the soybean, all this stuff for the peanut. And I, and I, I mean, he just... He understood so many different things. He had lots of uses for flowers and all kinds of stuff. That's why the book's called The Man Who Talks With Flowers, because he would take these walks with God, and the flowers would talk to him. You need, you need to read the book. It's fascinating. But he said this. He never took any textbooks into his lab. He brought his Bible in there. He would open up his Bible, and he would begin to worship the God of creation. And... It, and he, 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 he began to explain how God would, really, he would, he would open his eyes to the spiritual realm, and like the soybean would appear before him. And God would break the soybean down on an atomic level as if he was looking at blueprints. And God revealed to him how all the different components he used to make the soybean, he, re- he broke those components up into their separate components and then began to speak to Mr. Carver about how each component can do different things. That is not the accumulation and organization of 2D information. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that, that bird's blue. It likes red bugs. It flies this time of year. That's great. That's in, that's, that, and a lot of people are smart like that. They're very organized with stuff that anybody can see. But there's understanding behind that. And only God can reveal that. And he's sitting there. He's looking. He's looking. He's interacting. God broke it down to him, revealed it to him. He was able to take these components and do all this amazing things because God showed him how to do it. How things work in the Spirit. Go to 2 Corinthians 4 4. Oh, this is where we're headed, folks. This is where we're headed. He says in the Amplified, he says, 2 Corinthians 4 4, for the God of this world has blinded unbelievers' minds that they should not discern the truth. Like George Washington Carver, if you create and and maintain an atmosphere of heaven in your home or or office or wherever, listen, the devil can't keep the light from revealing all things to you. Where does 1 John 2.20 say? I have an unction, and I what? Know all things. 
Now, if you want to study that out, that unction is the result of Zoe life on the inside of you. If you look down a couple verses, he, he connects those dots. He says unction is what's derived from the Zoe life of God that you are born of. Hallelujah, friends. We're going somewhere. Let's all say that. I have an unction from the Holy One, and I know all things. It's been given to me to know the mysteries. Hallelujah. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I know a man. Turn your neighbor and say, is that you? I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or whether out of the body, I do not know. Listen, you, you, you and I are going to, we are coming into the same conundrum. Am I in the spirit or am I in the natural? Am I in the spirit or am I, am I in the natural? It looks like I'm in the spirit. But I see myself sitting down right, at, right, right over there. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just want to release this prophetic word here. I heard it this uh, morning. I, I've, I've just been meditating the uh, glory all day. And this is what I heard the Lord say. That because of the diligent endeavor to communicate on the real reality of heaven, many in this house will be caught up to see it firsthand. And not have to die. Why? Because we're coming into the time where he's given us the keys or what? The knowledge of how things work in the spirit. And while we've had expectant faith, the desires of your heart are going to be realized. Hallelujah. I don't know if that freaks you out, but it shouldn't. Dr. Larry's been preaching on heaven for I don't know how long. Hallelujah. And the Lord's just been waiting on somebody to just say, Lord, show that to me. Let me, let, let me experience. How are you going to spirit? experience it? Well, in the body, out of the body, I don't know. Translated, translocated, I'm not sure. But he's going to open up that which has been veiled in a mystery. Come on, again, what are Bible mysteries? They're hidden things, but what? Not from you. They're hidden for you. Listen, and they're hidden so the devil can't know anything about it. Listen, if you really believe that only God knows the future, what is that, Isaiah 40-something? Only God knows the future. Listen, what does Jeremiah 29, 11 say? For I know the plans that I have towards you, or I know the thoughts that I think towards you, and I know the plans. Thought, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to what? To prosper you. What's another translation say? I'm looking for a certain word here. To what? To give you a what? A future. Listen, we're in the days, remember it says like the spirit, no man knoweth. He's like the wind, he's there and there. The, the only way you know the spirit's been there is because the leaves moved. But you don't, you don't know where he came from and you don't know where he's going. You can only know he's been there. That's you and me in these days. Why? Because we have strategic advantage. How do we have the strategic advantage? Because only God knows tomorrow. Most believers uh, are so consistent in their natural reality that the devil has written his own chronicles about your life. You are, I say you loosely, I'm not talking about you, somebody. We, <laughs> many times are so consistently carnal, the devil doesn't even have to try. He reads us like a book. I know what they're going to do tomorrow. I'm not even worried about it. Just go ahead and set this up and set that up and set that trap up and put that on them because they, they'll, they'll take it. But our destiny is to be so one with the Spirit, people don't even know where we've come from. They don't even know where we're going. The only way they know we've been there is because the leaves are moving in the, in, in the trees. Something just shifted in this moment. Something changed. 
Something was rearranged. Why? Because God gave us revelation. It's a mystery. It's hidden. The devil does not know tomorrow. All he has is predictions. Listen, psychics, crystal balls, card readers, star readers, all that stuff, it's all predictions made by familiar spirits because they've read you like a book. They know your next week, not because they're psychics, because they know what you've done for the last five years. They have predicted your next five years. They said it and forget it. Hallelujah. But we're going to have the advantage. And instead of us trying to play catch up with the devil, oh, oh, oh no, he blew my papers off my desk. I'm following him around cleaning up his mess in my life. Like a good natural person. Chasing manipulated natural realities. Oh no, he knocked over the microphone stand again. Wasted time. Anybody getting what I'm saying? Instead, being light years ahead. Why? By the Spirit. Here, done this, built up, received it, done, implemented. Where now, Lord? Why? Future. Future understanding is advantage. It is tactical advantage. The devil's going, what are they, what, 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 what? <laughs> Say amen or oh me, something, hallelujah. Where are we at? Second Corinthians 12, look at this. I know a man in Christ, in the body, out of the body, I don't know. Why? Because I'm, I'm amalgamate. I'm so one with this thing now, I don't even know. Am I in the spirit right now or am I in the flesh? Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. He said, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. He was caught up in the paradise. He heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Listen, Paul was so vividly aware of another dimension. And the reality of its dominion, he said, surely there must be a law that restrains men from speaking of such things. But then at the same time, he boasted that God would allow a man to be made aware of them. God is wanting to show us great and wonderful things. God wants to show us how things work in the Spirit. Now, Paul was eager to introduce this, eager to introduce people to this dimension. But he struggled with the Corinthians. We were just there. He says, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual people. Why? Because you're dominated with the natural. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. We're getting close. Ephesians chapter 1, we all know this, 17, 18, 19, 20. I believe that this was birthed um, by the Spirit of the Lord, but Paul, a as he saw this reality of the spiritual dimension, the mystery was revealed to him that it became, it literally became a mandate. I must preach this. And so here's a prayer that I really think began and still is a travail. And this prayer is to wage war that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear. Look at verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the what? The eyes of our understanding would be, we could say it like this, flooded with light. 
Notice what it, li- it says there in the very last words uh, in the New King James, that we may know. Paul knows exactly what he's after in this prayer here. And, and in effect, he's writing to the Ephesians body there and to us today. The Spirit of the Lord is speaking to us today. He's saying, look, you're born again. Is there anybody in this room you are not born again? R- raise your hand. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. All right? You are born again. You know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are a brand new creation. Raise your hand. Give me a big shout. Hey! <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, so here's what he's saying. He was writing to a group of people that were born again, but in effect, here's what he's saying. You're born, but you're blind. Notice the prayer. Father, enlighten their eyes. But they're born again. But notice the prayer. Father, enlighten their understanding. But they're born again. Notice the prayer. Father, enlighten their eyes. Give them more knowledge. Give them the spirit of knowledge and revelation. They're born again, but notice the travail. Open their eyes. Praise Lord. I mean, he's coming from this. I was caught up. I saw this dominating, overarching reality. Came back down to the natural and says, Father, these are your inheritance. Open their eyes to what? To that realm which I had seen firsthand. Can you see the travail? Enlighten them. Let them see. Write this down if you're taking notes. To grow as a spiritual being. Now, let me ask you a question. Pause. Are you a body? You have a body. Are you a mind floating in the ether? No, what are you? You are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a tent. All right? To grow as a spiritual being, you need to see spiritual things. You need to hear spiritual things. Let me say that one more time. To grow as a spiritual being, a spiritual person. You are a spirit, correct? To grow as a spiritual person, you need to see spiritual things. And you need to hear spiritual things. Again, Paul says, you're birth, but you're blind. You need to see some stuff. You need to hear some stuff. Well, now, brother, don't get out there all weird. You know why we're weird? Because we've been cut off from that realm. But in order to see, the eyes of our understanding must be open. Write this down. Divine experience is better than human explanation. Divine experience is better than human explanation. Dr. Larry has done a fantastical doctor level job of bringing heaven to us, but you need to experience it now. Can you get your faith on that? What's God been doing? He's been authorizing your faith, giving you something to put substance to. And in this house, there will be a majority of heavenly encounters. Say this, I receive my seeing eyes. I receive my hearing ears. I am taking steps to enter into the realm of your glory. 
I remember my late spiritual father, Kenneth Hagin. He said that he laid his Bible open to Ephesians chapter 1. And several times throughout the day, he would walk over to that passage and he would quote that. He would do it, I don't know, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, I don't know, different times. And he did that for several months every day. One day he began to notice. He began to notice something. His faith began to have substance. And his spiritual understanding, his knowing increased. He said he knew things that he didn't know before. And he turned to his wife one, one day, and he said that he had such an illumination of the Scriptures and what the Scriptures were saying that he was even slightly embarrassed over some of the things he had been preaching several years prior. He also said that he experienced some visions and visitations prior to this, but after, someone say after, after pressing in for wisdom and understanding, the visions and encounters increased. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that Jesus said he wants to do more spiritual things among us, in us, and through us. Here's the word of the Lord. Let me tell it to you one, one more time. The Lord said, tell the people to make every effort to fellowship together in, stay united with, and keep focused on the mandate of becoming a glorious people with a glorious demonstration, a spiritual people with a spiritual demonstration. Can I give you one last verse and we'll close here? Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Did anybody get anything? Hallelujah. Were you encouraged? Hallelujah. Now, we didn't take you there, but I quoted it, but it said, it's been given to you to know the mysteries. 1 Peter 1.12 says, the things that angels even desire to know about. Ephesians 3.10 says that the manifold wisdom he predestined or destined that that knowledge, that understanding, that revelation would come through what? The church. You. Hallelujah. Revelation 3.18. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, white garments that your shame would be covered. And the very last thing, notice what he said. Notice what he's counseling us in. Well, what are you talking Are we going to see angels and demons? I don't know, maybe. But your understanding. You will know and be known. You'll have an understanding that is not derived from this natural realm. You'll see things. Oh, yeah. And you're going to hear things. You'll be places you didn't know were possible to go. Hallelujah, somebody.